So we're going to um, start with this right quick before we go to the bird. Um, but I wanted to just test. Uh, it's not something that I guess we talked about in the beginning of class, but when you're working with watercolor and ink, some inks um, will not show up as much when you put the watercolor over them. Um, so if you're working and you want a darker line, if your pen is not quite showing up, either excuse me, you either need to um, go back over it or uh, pick a different pen to use if the watercolor is covering the line. So right now I have uh, out, this is a Statler pigment liner, this is the Faber-Castell, this is a dip pen with India ink, and then I just put the super black uh, pen on there. And these don't say they're pigment liners, it says it's permanent, mm -hmm. waterproof. Um, so it may be a different ink than that. I did notice with the dip pen and the India ink, that it almost is uh, a little bit of a waxy feel to it. So I think whatever is in the India ink, when you put the watercolor over it, it kind of pushes the watercolor back just a little bit. So it, it shows up pretty well. Um, and I'll pass this around, but I have cobalt. I used uh, my Parole Scarlet. And then I pulled out, uh, this is biz, <laughs> it's hard to say, Bismuth Vanadate Yellow. And the reason I got that one out is because I was looking at my Daniel Smith chart and it's an opaque color. And um, it did, on those two, kind of lose the line a little bit. You can't see the line as well. And um, it did a little bit over the India ink. So I thought I would put it over the Super Blacks as well and just see what they do. Um, so let me get the Cobalt to start. And I'm not, um, the first two that I'm using are semi-transparent. I always think of cobalt as being transparent, but it's listed as a semi-transparent. And then, uh, yeah, I didn't use a true transparent. <laughs> Got your glasses? Yeah, now I can actually see. see. <laughs> that always helps. Okay, and then I have a little side. These are kind of nice little side palettes. They, um, I believe they go with the Cheap Joe's palette that you can um, purchase. I think they're like a dollar or something. And they're cheaper plastic, but if you're trying out colors or you want to make a, a palette for a specific painting and you want to just keep all those colors together, they're, they're nice to use. Mine, a lot of those have dried in there, so they're kind of loose. Okay. And then I'll dry that right quick just so that we can see that in same comparison mode. I have a lot of water in the red, so it's not quite dry, but that's okay. Um, one thing I did notice about the uh, dip pen in India ink is it probably needed a little more time to dry because it is very permanent, but uh, depending on how thick it goes on, it can take a little longer to dry. So there are a few places in the India ink where it feels like it moved just a little bit. It's very minor. Um, and then, yeah, probably these three don't do so well with the opaque color, and uh, the India ink was the one that did the best. But I'll pass it around so you guys can see. And it's very minute. It's not like it's a huge difference, but um, just something to be aware of when you're working with the different pins. And uh, then I've kept going with my uh, bird's following Inktober, so I'll pass that around for the, I don't remember where you guys saw last, but uh, maybe there-ish. So, if you want to see those. And... So, the one thing, oh, I need to go grab, hold on. So uh, last week when I was uh, working with this, uh, I was trying some marks on some of the foliage uh, behind the bird and I didn't like the ink marks I was making. So I pulled out the Daniel Smith watercolor ground and there's actually some on the outside here so you can't read it anymore. But um, this one is the titanium white and uh, for those, 
in, in the YouTube land that haven't heard about it, um, Daniel Smith created this watercolor ground and they have different colors that you can paint on. Uh, you could paint on watercolor paper. You can use it on wood, glass, plastic. You can use it on regular canvas and then you let it dry and it says 24 to 72 hours to let it dry and then you can paint on it just as if it were watercolor paper. So it, yeah, it gives it a nice texture and um, the different colors, I've played with them. I did a uh, um, blog post for Daniel Smith that talks about how I do my uh, glass Christmas ornaments and so I, I paint this on and that's available on the Daniel Smith website so if you want to see that um, post. So it's basically kind of like a whiteout. Um, where I painted it, I didn't worry about getting um, it real smooth. It's in the background so it won't bother me if it has a little bit of texture, but it can add some texture. So you have to be careful if you're working on like a figure's face and it's very smooth. If you tried to use it on that, it could add texture that would make that area look unusual. So I would just be cautious about using it um, without regard on a watercolor painting. I would just say in small areas or areas where there's texture, it's fine, but just be careful um, because you don't necessarily, there's, sometimes it's better just to leave well enough alone <laughs> rather than try to mess with it. Um, have you ever purposely used it to make, to make texture? I have Nothing not yet. Watercolor? I have not yet, but I would imagine that you could. You just you could build it up and play with it, and then mm -hmm. that would be an interesting thing to, to play with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you did that, I would say you'd probably even want to give it a lot longer yeah. to dry because that thickness could take a while to dry. So uh, all I'm going to do, and we'll see, hopefully it will work, I'm going to use... I don't remember if I used Oriole or New Gamboge, but um, I think it was New Gamboge. I think so. And um, just a little bit of um, cobalt. I think I may have had cerulean in there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll grab a little bit of cerulean. Come here. Okay. And so I can just paint right back over that area. And I'm trying to keep it a little light because I don't want it to get too dark next to the um, gray background. So then I'm able to just cover back over that and then I can go back and redo the ink line because I did go over the edges of my ink line just a little bit. And that'll dry and it'll be, it'll feel just like it's um, part of the paper. It doesn't look any different in that area to me. Um, and there was just a little bit of some texture to it, I noticed as I was touching it, so, you know, it does have a little bit of texture. And um, the next thing is we're going to start, for me, uh, depending on where you guys are in your paintings, I am going to go back to my bird and start um, adjusting things. So I have kind of a first layer everywhere, and now I can decide, I could leave it like that if I want to, it depends on how um, detailed you want to make it look or if you want it to feel a little more graphic. So if you're wanting it to feel a little more kind of poster-like or graphic, then you might just do um, kind of a basic wash in places or if you want it to have a little more texture and detail, then it can make it feel a little more realistic. So um, the first area is I want to adjust. I don't know if you guys get these out of the way now that I've played with them. Oh I found this at uh, Miningers. It's a it's a um, oh. handle and I just thought oh look at the pretty colors and <laughs> so oh, cool. I had to get that one. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah I probably can't see that touch better. I had this issue last week too. Um, okay, so I am going to add some uh, a little more gray looking shadow down in here because this is a little too blue for me and plus it needs a little more value anyway. So I will pull out the cobalt and some burnt sienna. To make a gray 
and I can vary it so it can be a little warmer in places or I can make it a little cooler if I would like. And I am going to use uh, clear water and just uh, dab it in places around where the shadow starts right there because there's hard and soft edges. And just by placing some water on there, it forces me to have hard and soft edges and have it be a little more random. Um, you could place the color on, uh, this new color on, let it start to dry and lift some edges, or you could let it dry and then try to soften some edges here and there. But by placing it on there um, prior to working with it, and I'm not really looking for the water now, I'm just letting it happen. If it does, it'll cause a softer edge, and it also helps kind of create my um, edges too because it pulls the paint when it hits the water. Okay, so then I'm going to start pulling it this way. Now I have not um, placed some water on this side but I will once I get a little farther over there. And So I'm working kind of quick because the edge that's over in here has will start to dry. Bring just a little bit down that way, and then as I come over here, I can come in with some clear water and apply it so that it fades as I'm coming that way. And that way it will go from a darker feeling to lighter as it hits the water. there. Okay, so the um, tail area of the bird needs to have some shadow as well and I'm just going to go down into here. Got a little green in there. We will get rid of that. I think I touched some of the green that was sitting on my palette. That's where uh, at that point, you should probably stop and clean your palette and not keep using that The area, area was not wet, correct? It was not wet, okay. right. And so this is the other way that you can do it. So I put the color on and now I'm just touching some edges here and there. Um, and that is also a way that you can blur an edge without um, having it move too far or having it be kind of random like this was. So that was a little more random. All right, and then this part of the tail is uh, in shadow, kind of all the way down. And I'm going to put just a little more warm with the burnt sienna in there. And then he has a little piece right here that's um, not as dark as the area next to it, and it's actually got just a touch of blue, it feels like to me, in it. Um, like there's some light kind of coming through it, so I don't want to make it very dark. And if you don't have that piece on there, um, it's probably a feather that is a little blurred, um, moved away from the side of his tail. And if that's not there, no one's going to know, so don't worry about if you didn't put that in there. Um, all right, and then his, around his neck, I need to dry right there so that I don't actually put some black down into that area. So I am going to make a mix for black using um, Thalo Blue and Alizarin Crimson. And these two colors, when mixed together, can make a beautiful black, but it can be a little frustrating trying to get there because when you are making it, you should get out both colors and you're not going to put a lot of water with them. So you're getting pretty strong pigment. And um, so I'm really loading up my brush and I won't need a lot, but I just need it to be thick, not a lot of, I think you guys could see that, um, a lot of uh, pigment, not a lot of water. Okay, and then I will clean this. Did you say it's Thalo? That's Thalo. Thalo yeah. and? Alizarin, permanent Alizarin Crimson. 
And because Thalo Blue has got some green to it, and Alizarin Crimson is leaning toward a cooler red, it's, um, oops, yeah, that's my Alizarin. Uh, it's leaning toward purple or blue, it's not a warm red, then those two colors together can give you a really nice black. So I've pulled out the alizarin. Now I have my brush full of alizarin. I'm not going to go clean it, but I need to be careful when I go over here because this is so full of alizarin that I'm just going to start with a little bit of the thalo and decide, okay, is that um, black enough or is it a lot of alizarin still? If it's still got a lot of alizarin, then maybe I'll go get a little more of the um, thalo. And so when I'm working with it, it makes a really strong black. Now you can also thin that and use it as a gray. You can lean it more toward the red side or the burgundy side so you could make that black kind of a kind of a burgundy black. And then you could also lean it more toward thalo, so it's a more blue black, depending on what you're seeing or what you want to put on the painting. Alright, so then because this is so dark, at this point it's going to um, basically become my dark, it won't have, you won't see the ink line. And you could also, depending on how you want to do this painting, you could do this as ink. You could take uh, India ink and um, straight out of the bottle and paint it on there. Um, you could use uh, an ink, your ink pen, whether it's the technical pen or whatever, and make the um, hash marks. Now this is a little dark in some places, but because um, I can go back and lift some lighter feathers, I am not going to worry about that. I'm just going to go ahead and put it on there. But as I come down, I will start to um, put a little water here and there. I just didn't want to lose what was on my brush. So, like right in here, there is an area where the feathers feel a little lighter, and it did uh, make it, it did push it a little red, which is fine, kind of gives it interest. And then I'm going to just kind of keep going, and I'm looking at both edges. So the outside edge is a little ruffled on the left, yep, and so is the one on the right. So, and I, I, want, I would start at the top up there because it gives you pretty much a direct route to come down where you're not, um, so it's just the one edge I'm watching. I did go down by the eye for a few seconds, but now I'm just following this edge. And just keep going, and pretty soon, get around the other side. And I could, at this point, start adding a little water to, well, it's pretty dark under there. I was going to say I could start lightening it if I want to, but I think I'll just keep going. And it gets a little flatter around the bottom. And then up in here is just a little few marks there. And then because this is a really dark black, I will also be adding a little bit of this to the bird's eye because, uh, like I, I believe I told you guys, um, I always want the bird's eye to be nice and strong and dark. And so I will use some of that. And I already had a little bit of gray in this area from earlier. I think I had uh, soda light on my brush earlier and had used some in there, so I'm just kind of going back over it now to darken it. Right, and I'm going to come up in here, and there's just a few kind of little wispy, and I probably should go down to a smaller brush at this point. Even though this gets a really nice um, tip to it, it can start to get a, just be a little big in some areas. And with the feathers of birds, it's really nice to be able to just really make some small marks sometimes. 
Okay, so in here, I'm just going to put a little bit in to also increase its depth. And then on the outside of those feathers right there, he's got some dark right in there, and then it gets light. So I'm going to clean my brush mostly and use that while it's still damp to create that light area right there on the beak. And then I'm going back for the black to place some on the beak itself. And I'm fine if, if those soft edges sort of blur into that light area that I, the water I just placed on there, because that will make it feel more like the beak is rounded or three-dimensional. Okay, and then there's a bit right there. The darkest part of this beak is actually toward the tip, like from right here and right in here, that, that triangle. And then he's got a little bit of a little lighter right back in here. Okay. Um, so the I would keep working with just the different things I'm seeing. Like there's some little tiny feathers right in there, so you could get a, a smaller brush out and um, just start putting in some of those little marks if you'd like to. The um, other thing that I will do on mine is come back into that sort of blue-gray and use some of that just to start making some brush marks. Like this part is not truly white in here, but I don't want it to get too dark either because it's just a little lighter patch. And so just by putting a little bit of color in there, it uh, tones it down just a little bit. He's got some places under his beak, that's a little too blue, that are um, a little gray where the feathers come down and so I can put some of that in and then as well over here. And for the feathers I'm just really looking at which way they're going around um, as I'm doing this. And then under his eye that's lighter as well and same thing over his eye because of where he is in shadow he has uh, some shadow that's over the eye. So I, I will come in and get rid of some of that white. I don't want to necessarily lose all of it and I will try to leave because there's a few highlights in there that are white. Um, but just starting to do that, now he's starting to have more um, three-dimensional character and more texture. And then the, the last thing, once this would be totally dry. I think it's dry enough, yeah, up here where I can come in, probably not with this brush, but if I wanted to lift um, just a little bit of some highlights out, let's see if I can do it, yeah, where I can just bring, I think I want my flat brush, just a little water in there, and then that will also give it the feeling that light is hitting him where it's just a little lighter. And so this, if you had time while you were painting it on, you could paint a little water on that area and then touch next to it with your darker color and it would automatically give you um, some of those lighter areas. And thalo, because it is a staining color, is not going to lift as easy as some things, but it will probably be just enough that it's okay. Okay, um, so I will let you guys go get started on yours. Um, actually, if you would like, I can show you the base coat on the tree branch, yeah. and then I'll go from there and uh, later, and that way it'll start to be dry. So I'm going to use um, my burnt sienna and uh, cobalt, but I think I'm also going to get out some burnt umber. So if you have burnt umber, let me clean this green off. 
Burnt umber is a cooler brown, and it also can make a gray, but it's a nice variety to have for this particular piece of wood because it has that little bit of a cooler brown feel to it in places, and then it's got the more kind of orangey, vibrant look too. So we'll get more cobalt. You could use ultramarine blue also instead of the cobalt, um, but this branch doesn't go really dark, so I thought I'd just use the cobalt. And some burnt sienna. And then I'll take a little bit of the burnt sienna into the cobalt and kind of get that sort of pre-mixed for a somewhere in between gray-brown. And I can do the same thing with the burnt umber. So I have a little variety going. And then you can paint it on dry, but I think I'm going to actually wet it for the first coat and let it be a little more random. So it really depends on how you want to do it because if, if you want to start with maybe the warmer color and put the warmer color in, let that dry and then come back and put the cooler um, gray, you could do that as well. But I think just to, in the order, uh, in trying to get time for you guys to paint and also just to get some base color on here, I think this works. And it's a little quicker. Okay, so I'm coming close to that, but probably not touching right up to it. And same thing here, if I can get in there. And then because, oh, I did hear from someone uh, who was looking at the video, uh, last week's video online, and she said that uh, when she's working with hot press paper, she will actually wet it twice, and that um, seems to work better than just wetting it once because it, it, it's like it soaks up the water and then it needs another application to really keep it moist. So I will try that with this. I'm going to, and it, I don't know if uh, she was thinking it needs to uh, dry just a little bit or just sit for a few seconds before mm -hmm. she puts the next layer of water on. But um, I think I will just start back at the top because by the time I've gotten down to the bottom here, I imagine this is already starting to lose some of its moisture. Okay, so do that. Go back up. And I did notice as I was tipping my head there that there, I did miss a, a place right there. So I'm going to re-wet. And I don't want this to be really wet just because I want things to kind of place or stay where I'm placing them. But, um, yeah, if it, I don't want it to dry on me either. Okay. And then remind me, when I turn the video off, I have a uh, image of someone who I've been watching on the Inktober with how they work with. It's very minimal how they put watercolor. It's mostly ink with just a splash of color, which is really cool. So, I'm going to show you guys. All right, so I've got that wet everywhere, and there are places where it is definitely warmer, kind of burnt sienna color. So I'm going to start with that, and there's also a few places where it feels like the sunlight is hitting this branch. And because I have now applied water to the paper, and it's not moving, so that's good moisture level there, um, I can come in and I want to um, have more pigment on my brush, less water at this stage, because the water that is already on the paper, so I want it to be darker. Um, it will go lighter because watercolor is going to dry 20 to 30 percent lighter anyway, but having um, it darker will help it when it starts to dry because I'm, I've added water to the mix with the water on the paper. All right, and I'll bring some down there. And this warm on this branch can really help with the overall feel of the painting. Um, because it was feeling very cool 
So having this on there is a nice counterpoint to the um, coolness of the Blue Jay. All right, I'm trying to get this on kind of quickly. So I'm, I'm using this as a guide, but it's not giving me, I'm not, I don't have to do exactly as it's got. More just, I don't want to make the whole thing burnt yeah. Okay, so that I've got that on there. I do like how it's working with the double application of water. Yeah, that's spreading a whole lot nicer. Uh huh. Okay, and so I'm going to come in and get a little bit of the burnt sienna with the gray. Oh, I just went over my highlight. <laughs> no, that's highlight. That's where the sun is. All right, and then this is the burnt umber with, make sure I go around that, uh, the burnt umber with uh, cobalt. I'm kind of like liking that difference. I'm going to have to get some more out. Okay, so because this is the first layer, I can come back and start picking out places individually, like where I've made my ink line, and go, okay, I'm going to darken that piece. Um, and that will give it the layering that makes it feel like it's got texture. And so I will do that next after it's dry. Okay, so now I've gone back. That was right there. I still had some of the burnt umber on my brush, but I just went over and grabbed uh, some of the burnt um, sienna with oops, with the uh, cobalt. And it's so similar that um, I don't know that there's a huge difference right now in what I'm seeing. I think I'm going to leave... Well, he would probably have shadow, and I will have to get some more color out. Remember, okay. and I actually kind of want just a little bit of blue in this, because that will help bring the color of the bird around the painting. So, um, I'm going to go up, ooh, that's a lot of blue. Kind of on the shadow side of the branch. And then I'll get more of the burnt umber in the mix. More burnt umber. It's staying wet really well right now. That's the truth. Yeah. Now we know. Oops. Going over my edge. And I think there's a little bit of light on whoops, call Lee. I keep going over <laughs> over my edges. I'm not taking my time. Um, so this will need to be dark enough that it will stand out from the background. So when I come back over it with a second layer, and I want just a little bit on here, um, I will have to make sure that there are pieces along the edges that go a little darker. But for now, it's, it's fine. Um, so yeah, I think that adds a nice um, contrast to the cool parts of the painting. And I, I think the other thing that I will do once um, I've got a little more on here is I will come back in where there are some pine needles from, a, a, there are two trees in that area. Um, and I can come in with just a few of those, and I'll just put one or two right quick so you can see it, where I'm kind of letting them sort of peek through back here um, so that there is a little bit of warmth in the background that also will pick up the colors of the log. And that way it'll feel like everything is sort of working together. So. All right, so I'm going to leave that and let you guys go start working on yours and I'll come around. And then I interrupted. Okay. So um, I will be doing at least two layers on here, but possibly three over this because I need to give a little more definition um, because right now it's pretty much one value except for the really highlighted areas. Mm -hmm. And so 
I want to put a little more shadow in some of those, so I'll show you that, and then I would let, or not shadow, but color on the marks of the different parts of the wood on the branch. And then um, I'd let that dry, and then I'd put some shadow, probably comes about right here-ish, um, and goes this way over the branch, and it has a little bit of a curve right there. Um, it may actually even be up into here right past the beak just a little bit, but I might fudge it just a little, I'm not sure. But somewhere right in here, and it curves to follow the branch for the shadow that the bird is causing on the branch. Oh, and good. then once that's dry, then I can come back, and there's some places which, um, it may not show real well, but there's some places where the bark is lifted, and it's got some darker places underneath it. And I can put some either some ink in there to darken those to make them feel like they're shadowed or um, a little bit of watercolor to give it some more. So it's, um, it's kind of that process of working it up. Now with this ink and watercolor we did less ink, more watercolor. With the next one that we will do, we are going to do more ink and then you guys can decide how much watercolor you want to put in. So um, doing the um, Inktober, I've done a hummingbird that is just ink and lots of different um, little feather marks and so I'm basically using the ink as a way to create the values on the bird mm -hmm. so lighter darker mid value and then this one has um, ink he has lots of marks but he has a lot more watercolor on there and then this one is a lot of ink marks and just a little bit of watercolor and I used the ink in the background to describe some of the leaves that were back there, but I used it kind of in a dashed sort of way and lighter so that it feels like it's in the background, it's not as important as the bird. And I just decided for this one that I wanted just to highlight those vibrant um, head and throat feathers, and so I just did it that way for, for that one. But um, So I will send you guys the um, picture and then you can decide if you want to do that one or if you want to do a different one but that's the way I'll do I will do a lot of ink work and show you um, basically what I'm doing for that and then you can decide how much watercolor you want to put on it or, or not and if you want to do your own image you're welcome to um, so for this one I pulled out um, the cobalt some burnt sienna and I need to get some more burnt umber and again, it, you know, probably just using one, the burnt tanna or the burnt umber would be fine. You don't need to pull both out, but uh, I kind of liked playing with it. And I need a little more cobalt. Um, so I'm going to start there, and then there's a few things on the birds uh, while this is drying, just for a few seconds, and then I'll dry it and show you maybe where I'll put the shadow and um, from the bird onto the branch, and then. I will stop there. So I'm getting more cobalt. And it's very dry right now and I'm not wetting the paper because now I want to place the color and I want it to stay where I'm placing it. So, and actually that's going to be really dark. Okay. Um, I'm just going to pick out some places that I want to increase their value and as I'm doing it, I can, within a shape, I can change color, so I could go over to Burnt Sienna if I want to and put some of that in there. I can also just lighten, so if I have a dark area and then I just say, you know, I want this area to be just a little lighter, I can just put water right up next to it and sort of lighten it as it comes down, so I don't have to continue that whole shape, whatever it is, as one value. And then I can go back and change. So I'm sort of just kind of going down this line right now. But if you get to a point where it's like, oh, I don't want to really continue that mark, just taking a little bit of water, clear water at the end, and I would come away from it and then touch up next to it now it has a place for that to go and it just kind of blurs down. So you don't have to continue that harder edge to darker mark if you decide you want to adjust what it's doing. Okay. 
And it is sort of, I'm kind of looking there, but I'm just sort of making it up too as I go. And sometimes that's the hardest thing is to make it up. And I'm going to use a little bit right here. So some of this could also be dry brush. So dry brush is taking color onto your brush and letting it make marks on your paper um, that are more random. And so I have color on here. It's a little harder to do with a round brush, but I'm drying the back edge of it. And if I take it, and it, and it actually works pretty good to hold it sideways, and let's see if I can get it to mark. Yeah. I'm not liking the, I may have to use my flat. The flats tend to work better for this. And actually I have a, this is called a grainer. So it has longer and shorter bristles. And because um, the flat brush doesn't hold a lot of water and, on, and then also just because it's got those longer and shorter bristles, well, helps if you actually have enough paint that it shows. I can take that, come on, and by using the grainer, you can add texture to those areas that automatically makes it feel a little more like bark. And so uh, that brush is a real handy one. I don't use it that much, but I've used it for grass and sometimes, um, uh, feathers or hair on an animal, um, this kind of thing, and um, so you can you can play with that as well. Um, that to me is getting a little into the uh, detail of things, so I wouldn't necessarily start with that. Um, I want to get more color in here because right now the important thing is to make sure that this branch is separating from the background value-wise and also to give it more um, texture. So even though we're working with ink and watercolor and we've got a dark line on there, we still need to make sure that our values are strong enough that um, it's working overall. Okay. So just going to keep, ooh, that's blue. And I will just keep going with it. I hear an audible gasp in the YouTube audience, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always doing that. Sucking in here. <laughs> now, to me, that just adds um, interest. Um, and there are certain times where something like that, I would be like, oh, no. But it just, you know, that little bit of color change in there that's unusual can catch someone's um, eye. And it, I don't know, it also carries the blue from the bird around. So I'm using some of that tone that I had there earlier to kind of inform what color I'm putting in here right now. And that's burnt sienna with the cobalt still. So, and then also the fact that the light is coming from this direction, I have more darks on that side. And I like that light right there, so I'm going to take a little bit of water and just wet so that I don't lose that area. And then I can come around that. Okay, and then I'll just follow my ink line for that one. And then um, last little bit, because this is trying to get this in here kind of quick, is just to give a few marks up in there. And use a little bit of the burnt umber and blue. You should always make sure that if it's going under something that it repeats so that it makes sense, the color or the value, depending on what it's doing, because the value might change. All right. So there's enough going on now that it has a good second coat. And I wanted to show you a couple other things and then I'll dry this if it's not quite dry. And um, then I'll let you guys go back to do yours and I'll, I'll show you the shadow on it right quick before I have you go back. So um, on the bird himself, I'm still looking at it. I'm looking at my photo. I'm seeing if there's any 
thing that I want to adjust and there's just a tiny bit more um, it feels like a little bit of cobalt up in here right by the top of his head and I'm going to take my water then and just let it kind of blur down into that area and that little bit of vi more vibrant color up there um, is kind of nice because it picks up some of the color down here. I also felt like there was a little down in this lower portion of his back. So I wet that area because when I put this on, I want it to just soften up into the water. And so this is just a thin glaze of color. I'm not putting on very much. Oops, that's dry. Didn't wet that high. Okay. And um, so that that little bit of extra color can start to make the back feel a little, um, give it more depth. So sometimes it's just um, a thin glaze. And then uh, down here, this is not vibrant enough for me. I want it to go a little darker. So even though I haven't put the black on yet, it will still need to get the black in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put a little more color for those feathers because they are, when, when they catch the light, they are very turquoisey kind of mix between turquoise and cobalt blue. Just a little color there. And then on his tail, his tail is not quite as vibrant as up there. Um, so I think I'm going to take more cobalt with a teeny tiny touch of the burnt sienna in it so it's a little grayer and actually need to use my water that's on there to pull it down just a little bit and then that will need to get the the dark lines eventually um, so I'll keep going with that. Uh, the, the feet I haven't done yet, but I'm not going to now because I want that to be dry. And then the other thing I noticed was that uh, I hadn't done anything down here with these branches yet, and they, they are too close in value to the background. Mm -hmm. So all I did was just pulled out uh, the cerulean and uh, a little bit of burnt sienna for kind of this more muted green. And I'll just do this one. Um, just by coming in with a little bit more color, uh, I can adjust that value and make them feel like they're separated from the background. Mm -hmm. um, it would depend on where they are, whether or not you want them to be that strong. They could be just sort of muted, especially with pen and ink. Um, so it, it's kind of a you know, decision on what you want to do, uh, whether or not you want to go darker with them. But I think because this is mostly watercolor with just a little bit of pen and ink, I wanted that contrast. Um, so let me dry this and I'll show you the shadow and then we'll finish up for today. So one of the reasons to put color on his feet, because when you're doing pen and ink, you can decide, okay, where do I want to put the color? How much do I want to put on? Is right now, because they are so white and very graphic with the dark lines on there, they're drawing attention. So when they have color, it will be back up to his head and they won't draw as much attention. So you have to kind of think about that when you're deciding where do I want to put color or, where, um, or what do I want to leave uh, without color. So, okay, it's mostly dry. It's a little damp. Um, so to do the shadow, I'm going to take, um, I think I'm going to use cobalt and burnt sienna because it's a grayish shadow. It's on a branch that's grayish brown. I'm not going to push it toward purple or anything. So I'm just using some of those same colors and I will leave it kind of a gray mix. Actually, I want just a little bit of burnt umber that I have over here in that rather than it being too Gray. that's better okay so now when I'm coming over it I'm looking at um, where am I seeing the shadow and one it's going to be uh, kind of where his head 
it actually comes up into here, I think. Right about into there. And it comes down sort of at a curve over. And that, I'm going to leave that little highlight there. I like that. I don't know. Later I might look at it and decide, no, I don't want that there. But for right now, I'm going to leave it. And, and then I'm basically just shadowing all of that going over those and then somewhere right there is a highlight like right in there where the light is catching through that and all I need is more burnt over And I can't tell because it's not as vibrant a light. It's a little more muted light. I can't tell where it connects in here. Um, so I'm going to guess that's covered. And then maybe I'll just sort of bring it down right into that area. And then a little bit over this branch right there. Okay. So... Um, that shadow kind of flattens this part mm -hmm. of it, um, but it's it needed to be there because it wouldn't make sense with him being lit otherwise. And I'm just putting a little shadow by his foot, and um, and then there is a shadow up over this, but I'm not going to worry about that one. Actually, I want to darken this edge though because that's not quite dark enough. Okay. And, okay, I'm, I will dry that and I'll show you the last little bit right in that area and then I will finish for you guys to be able to go back. Okay. So this is mostly dry. So then I can decide once I've got the shadow on there, I can decide, okay, I maybe need to go back in like right under where that's lifted up a little bit. Um, I think I want to darken right there. So I can still go in and either use the paint or um, my ink and start adding a little bit more value in a few of those places so that it gives them a little more um, depth. Yep, and definition. Yeah, so it could be painting um, the actual shape of something to make that part of the bark a little darker or um, just painting a little bit of the shadow around a piece. So this is almost done, but it just needs just one more layer and then it'll be done done. So for me, it will be painting the feet, getting those in, maybe looking and seeing if there's any other little touches. I did, which I don't know if I showed you um, on earlier, I did go in and take just a little bit of the cobalt uh, and used a tiny bit of it just for a few little marks in the whites of his feathers because and it could be cobalt uh, with some burnt sienna so it's a little grayer um, but just a few marks in the white area will keep it from looking just like there's it's flat yeah so you need just a little texture and um and that's it so i i still need to do the darks in those guys and i'll probably do that either with my um, thalo and a liz, permanent alizarin to, to color that in since I used it up here. Oh, and the last thing is that you can take a brush. So if you've put this dark in with watercolor, if you decide some of those edges are just a little hard, you can just use this brush has got a touch of, of water on it still. So I can come in and just by lifting up in a few places here and there, it softens it into the mm -hmm. feathers around it and also gives it that feeling of kind of a rough edge. So you get kind of a mix.
Thank you.